All right. Today I'm uh, hosting David Erickson. Goes by the handle Free the Frame on Instagram. So thanks for coming on, man. Thank you. <laughs> so David is um, what I would call the Greek word atapos, which is unclassifiable. It's a term that was used in the past for people like Socrates, where the, his contemporaries couldn't really pin him down, right? And that's definitely applicable to, to David. <laughs> it's something that we've yeah. been discussing before, right? He does a lot of different things. He doesn't really self-identify with uh, uh, yeah, an ideology or anything really of the sort, different. right? What, whatever modern society tends to do with people as a whole. So that's why like the, the introduction as an Atapos, it, it, it's actually quite fitting. Yes. Yeah, I like mm -hmm. it. And I think that also now it starts to show on my body, uh, which I only realized after I got the tattoos. So I was like, mm -hmm. oh, that's Taoism. Okay. And then we have the, the <laughs> Viking runes. And then I have some philosophical other stuff, you know. And that wasn't intentional. It was just, I guess, one uh, manifestation of... Um, of my philosophy being being wanting to be uh, non-defiable, mm. uh, kind of outside of, of boxes. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think that, I that's actually, been, a, been an mm. overall fear in life, I would say, mm. to not want to fit in, kind of. Mm. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. Probably partly conscious, partly uh, subconscious, why, why did it end up this way? Yeah, man. And that's also one of the one of the main or not one of the main reasons, but definitely something that we talked about quite often. And one of the main reasons why I wanted to have you on, right? Because we've been talking a lot over the past two to three years, maybe it's longer, three years, right? And um, a lot of the, the conversations with the philosophical tinge. And that's one of the, the things that always, let's just say, um, attracted me or resonated me to you or that resonated with you is that you weren't like trying to base yourself into this single layer of identity right that you're always like going through all the different streams of philosophy and thinking and that you didn't really pin yourself into one thing which is like I think um, in my head anyway, maybe I've told you at one point is also why I like like Conor McGregor because he's always himself, you know what I mean? Yep. Regardless of some yep. of the other circumstances around him. And that's like, sure. you're being yourself, right? That whole self identity yeah. thing. That's been a, a, a major thing um, when we've been talking and that I, I really just like and enjoy about you. You know, you show up yeah. as yourself. I appreciate that. Mm. Yeah, no, definitely a big inspiration on that. Uh, mm. would be Connor, uh, no doubt. Mm. <laughs> and uh, you know, it has has its dark sides, I guess. Uh, mm. In his case, either way. But uh, you know, I think no price is too high to pay to be genuine in in yourself. Mm. Um, so yeah, that that is me, and I'll, I'll always be that way. I hope, and uh, yeah. I've always been that way too. Too mm. with very like thinking back on it mm -hmm. it's like perhaps there were like glimpses in in school or growing up when there was like mm -hmm. nothing that really stood out but that mm -hmm. was never like in the in the box yeah fully uh, yeah man so maybe it took a while you know in, in teenage confusion years to realize mm -hmm. that that's actually a good thing um mm -hmm. and then you know you just end up fully embracing it and, and shaping yourself mm -hmm. yeah that way Let's dig into that a little bit because you grow up in Sweden, right? You are Swedish after all. Yes. And you're the no, son, of, <laughs> the son yeah. of two teachers, right? So you, you talked a little bit in the episode that I listened to with Devin about um, pedagogics and, and teaching. But I mean, that, that was also interesting. But being a yeah. son of two teachers and then going through school, right and being this like not really fitting in anywhere like how did that kind of <laughs> come to be and help you shape as you went into your teenage years sure yeah not be but like having two very mature and um educational type of parents mm. um but perhaps even more so they are just self-aware parents and and mm. having the knowledge to understand that what you can and cannot teach someone 
mm-hmm. uh, that it is a contextual thing and even for your kid however much you want to shape them a certain way you can can only lead by example and, and give them the provide information or the bricks and then they have to build it themselves mm-hmm. and my parents did that extremely well and i think that's how a teacher should be so mm-hmm. just as they shaped me by action and by just being um, mm-hmm. they also shaped how i want to approach being a teacher mm-hmm. how they taught me that mm-hmm. um, and that's more indirectly pointing people leading people in in the direction um in their direction not, mm-hmm. not what you think their direction mm-hmm. should be yeah. um and uh, less of trying to directly impact and, and have a, an opinion on where they should be going mm-hmm. um so I think that's even more important or the most important that shaped me that way. And mm-hmm. that was just imprinted very early on and, and that has always kind of been there. I mm-hmm. think like looking back, it's crystal clear that I would become a teacher of some kind. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's just how it goes, really. Mm-hmm. But even even in the moment, I think it's like, yeah, sure, there's years where you have no, no clue at all what you mm-hmm. should do or are going to do. Uh, but I think teaching something uh, was, was pretty obvious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what was the first entry into movement for you? Because you're, you know, like a movement yeah. coach now, if we can call it that. Sure. So yeah. sort of. Sure. Right? It's, it's a I'm part of your work. Some in... labels. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I um, actually what I posted today was I just randomly stumbled on, on an old picture of me it was um, mm. it was probably 18 or 19. Mm. Uh, so it's uh, like seven years ago, something like this. Mm-hmm. and just fat fat fluffy uh, kid basically mm-hmm. um and i remember maybe a few months prior to that i was approaching 100 kilos of mm-hmm. the absolute worst kind of uh, weight yeah. uh, and that was kind of the, like desperation point when i turned it around so mm-hmm. i lost probably closer to 10 for that photo and it still looks that bad um uh, but that's when I started uh, just training or doing something at least, like taking mm-hmm. care a little bit. Um, so it was just the standard. I was running, you know, you know, mm-hmm. before you know anything, and then you get into um, gym, gym training, mm-hmm. and the, the knowledge, uh, the information you can find is bodybuilding based. So that's kind of what I doing did for mm-hmm. about uh, half a year or something. Um, and then I realized I'm way more interested in getting strong. So then I started more powerlifting stuff and getting getting stronger, mm. um, which I enjoyed more. Uh, but then I came to a point in, in once the knowledge were accumulating and I was acquiring more, that I just understood how limiting that is if I can't touch my toes or can't do anything really with my body. Mm. Um, and I would, would say that was the transition into the movement world and seeing mm. that perspective of more what is my body capable of doing and how can I improve that mm. versus just uh, like losing weight or building muscle or um, these very mm. specific things, even if they're general as well. Mm. Was it somebody in particular that kind of led uh, the way? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, this is ironic, but it was Conor McGregor. Yeah. Um, oh, I get it. It was uh, yeah, the same for me, actually. <laughs> Yeah, it's ironic because he, mm. he got me. I was already a bit of an MMA fan, mm. which I would also say just watching these the MMA fights was inspiring me to take care of my health more. Yeah. Uh, so that was one inspiration. And then that led me to be a fan of Connor way, mm-hmm. way back in the day, like just as he was getting into the UFC. Um, and the way he spoke about the body and as like this, this is a highly inspirational in, individual in general. Mm. and his general perspective on it uh, in his field mm-hmm. and that's it's ironically also the where i got my instagram name from um, mm. that was his um, his words and probably when i created instagram i tried free the body and then mm. that popped back in my mind and i heard him express it like free the frame um, mm. so that's also where it came from yeah. and then that led me to uh, to edo and, and of course where yeah. everyone can ends up um, mm-hmm. And, um, but ironically, it was him that made me start seeing it like that. So, and then of course, Ido mm. was, uh, and is a big inspiration mm. for, for those things in the way he speaks about it. Yeah. Um, and then it just goes from there, you know, and I can just name drop the teachers all over that I uh, go yeah. to know or just attend a workshop with or, or just watch videos and, yeah. Uh, 
we might we might get into that a little bit as well. But for the people that right. don't know, Ido Portal is the hey, let, let's call him the grandfather of of movement as we know it today, right? Yeah, he's basically yeah, that's pretty accurate. He's he's mm -hmm. even posting and acting more like a, a grandfather. He's like slowing yeah. down a little bit and, and just being like yeah, no, I, I quite like him uh, mm -hmm. his post recently. Yeah, um, they're they're really good. So very I, I, deep and philosophical <laughs> and less less physical mm. or performancey, but mm. um, it's always a mind bender and, and things to contemplate when he posts. Oh yeah, hundred percent. And that's also um, a little bit more, let's say, inherent in the movement culture, right? It's perpetuated yep. by Ido Portal was a philosophical element, which yeah. it, it's not to say that that's not found in bodybuilding or powerlifting. It's just that you would have to find those individuals where that was the case. And where yeah. rather as a culture, it's more ingrained into the movement culture, which also gives I it that agree. dimension, right? I, I would also, I wouldn't say it's inherently a good thing though. Um, <laughs> I, I like it, of course, but uh, mm. I mean, there's, if you go into a specific field and then find an individual that just thinks a bit deeper about it, mm. that might be better or preferred um, mm. than because the movement, it's, it's still you have to find that individual that actually thinks about it deeply and, and mm. draws the relevant parallels between philosophy or uh, life in general with with how how to approach your movement mm. training practice um and in the movement culture it seems to me that it gets blown up and people are just talking philosophy and then uh, everything is related to everything and it's just it means nothing there's no no real benefit mm. or there's no nothing profound about it it's just mm. words um and that's a bit unfortunate but um of course i do i do agree that it should be uh, brought together the, the overall overarching philosophy and, and mm. what you choose to do as a physical practice of course yeah so when you got into movement you also like quite early on started teaching some of that if, if yeah. i recall that correctly yeah so you started teaching at a crossfit i believe it was yes mm. yeah back in my my hometown mm. close to anyway um yeah, it just popped up, you know, I think um, I already in that early stage, I was unique in, in a CrossFit center. <laughs> and to them, I was way more mobile than everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, so it just ended up with me teaching some movement mobility related uh, things. Mm -hmm. And then that kind of took up from there. Mm -hmm. um, I also started the online business basically the same time. Mm -hmm. um, I think actually it might might get a bit deep, but I mean that's what we're here for. It. I think yeah, fundamentally that was a big benefit of me because I was already kind of associating myself as a teacher mm -hmm. uh, from from an early age, just based on my parents and the way I was always ended up teaching when when I felt I could assist someone in something, mm -hmm. I took that role. Uh, and I think what many people struggle with when they become a coach or they're like looking to become already in the terminology they use they kind of shoot themselves in the foot in my opinion mm. um that i didn't have that issue it's like i'm i'm a, I'm a teacher i'm kind of natural at that mm. and now there's an opportunity to te teach this thing that i'm just getting into mm. cool um and uh, not to say that i have imposter syndrome i feel like i shit i, I you know looking at edo i need a good five years before i could teach this like all of that still struggled with that for sure mm. um but I think many people like they need something further away mm. to feel that they're a coach. So mm -hmm. that's where certificates exist, basically, um, which I yeah. never got uh, and, and don't mm. really believe in. So, uh, yeah, man, it's funny because I started teaching my friends as well, right back in the day. They, it, I'm not sure if it came very naturally to me as, as it did for you, but it definitely just kind of went like, okay, now if I, I have a base, right? Which I lost fat, I gained muscle. I'm, I'm getting proficient in these things. I want to help people do the same. And then from there, it kind of snowballed into to where we're at, right? But yep. uh, in any case. It. But it, it's an interesting thing. People just need to overcome that. Like mm. basically whenever there is a 
your the language you use is I need this before I can do that, or mm-hmm. I am becoming this. Mm-hmm. Like I think the main and first priority should be to shift your mindset as you are already that. Mm-hmm. Um, because there's fun like if you're becoming a coach, um, when when is the point when you are one? Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. That. And mm. also, if you are becoming one, then you are one. Because mm. it's, it's a continuous journey. It's not mm. like you become one and then you don't learn or then you don't do anything. It's mm. just um, it's it's a mindset shift. It's just like no, if that's what I'm gonna do, then then that's what I'm doing now. Mm. Um, and then then the rest falls into place as, as we both have experienced yeah a hundred percent and that's also what i thought was interesting about your journey right so you've been uh or then you went to seek out teachers right so who was the first person you started working with online um online it was the mindful mover mm. remember that so philip philip shop uh, i worked a lot with uh gmb uh with they were mm. more popular i'd say back back then that mm. was kind of my introduction overall i'd say mm. and the first few workshops i did was was gmb based mm-hmm. um then this yuri malmustine was pretty pretty early on mm-hmm. um, the that's the handstand guy <laughs> yeah i remember one of my first uh workshops in in italy with mm-hmm. him but you know, we, we're good friends now so it's super super fun to remember mm. Awesome. And then, um, because that's also what struck me about when you kind of decided to do this, the teaching, and then from a movement perspective that you just kind of decided on traveling throughout Europe, right? Doing, meeting people, training some people, teaching some classes, right? So run me through that a little bit. Well, how that kind of came into being. Yeah, it it, it was less of a, a, a... I'm not very much a, um, I want to be able to do that. Mm. So I'll do this thing. So I'll be able to do that. Mm. Maybe that's related to the coaching. It's like, no, I want to do this now. So I'll, I'll figure out a way to do that now. Mm. Um, and I wanted to, to travel and I wanted to learn about these things and meet the people. So whenever they popped up a workshop, mm. I figured out, I'd be, well, most likely I just signed up and then they'd like, you know, if I didn't have the money, I'd have to figure that out. <laughs> um, so uh, just that mentality kind of like no this is what i want to do and that is priority because mm-hmm. that's shaping who i want to become and who i am becoming mm-hmm. um so it's kind of relentless in that sense and just of course not taking loans and i'm being stupid about it but realizing that if uh, um if i put pressure on myself and mm-hmm. invest money in in traveling and, and meeting new people and, and learning about the things i want to coach Mm-hmm. Um, that just gives me more resources to to earn that money back or earn more. Mm-hmm. Um, and either way, it's it's something I want to do. So that's kind of bottom line. Um, and then it it was just something that caught my curiosity, and um, people on Instagram that you ended up you started talking to, um, meeting up with them throughout mm-hmm. around Europe. And in some places you got stuck, and in others it was just a quick visit, but. Uh, almost exclusively very good uh, memories and lessons based on mm. that. Yeah, because you spent some, uh, I think it was a few months in Ireland, right? Ah, way more than a few months. That's basically second home. Yeah. Um, it started with a few months and then it's like, you know, a, mm. few, uh, a few more months back home. I was like, shit, I miss, uh, I miss Ireland. Mm. Um, so it's definitely well, uh, like one and a half years total. And mm. then I was traveling from from there to other places in Europe and came coming back and so on, but definitely nice. a, a bit of a second home. Yeah, man. It's a bit of the nomad lifestyle. Yes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But I have to keep, I get reminded of it because it's been been quite a few years, right, where I've just been living like this. Mm-hmm. And I've never been a materialistic person. I never had that much things. Mm-hmm. Um, so like I, I have a backpack in Bali. I've been here one and a half years. And every, whenever I move, uh, move Villa just to to check out something new within Bali, mm. um, I need I need like one extra bag and my backpack. Mm. Um, that's it. I actually left my my suitcase at some place. I just had the clothes in it that I didn't really feel. But I don't care about this. So I just left it. Yeah, man. 
So that, that also brings up the another interesting part, right? Which is you deciding to move to Bali. I wouldn't put it like that, but I ended up here. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> was well, you we were talking about it before you moved, and it was a, a contemplative process, right? Because you had no. Yeah, sure. sure. No, I could see like it's, uh, it's coming. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, like Asia in general was just a place I hadn't explored yet, and I wanted to go. Mm. And then a few opportunities came up. It was a training event uh, workshop here the, that I timed my arrival with. Mm. Um, but as far as living here, that was not the plan. There was no plan at all uh, when arriving, <laughs> how long it would be. Yeah. And now we're one and a half, half years in. Of course, there's somewhat other reasons because mm. uh, why I ended up staying. But mm. yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, you've been making the most out of it anyway. <laughs> Oh, of course. Well, that's mm. everywhere I go. Yeah, man. Because one of the one of the other fascinating things is that you decided to just kind of take a break from society, right? And you spent, I think it was almost two months in the mountains in some obscure yeah. place in Bali. <laughs> yeah, it's not really a mountain, you know, it's still Bali. So uh, mm. it sounds way better when you live by yourself in the mountains. It yeah. is colder there though so there, it's a bit of an elevation mm. um yeah that was this time last year i think maybe end of end of april maybe mm. uh so april and no april and may i think it was mm. yeah now that was uh, probably the when the whole corona the shit hit uh people just go that was like the last five percent of me not I'm, I'm not putting up with anyone now mm. so bye bye for now um no, it was mostly to do with what you said, just a contemplating, isolated, uh, putting, mm. spending time in isolation. Mm. Uh, that's something I enjoy doing and, and resonate, uh, associate with a lot of benefits. Mm. Um, I never did to that extent before. So, mm. And was there, I mean, I, knowing you, I, it's an assumption that you didn't really come with like a whole plan and like, Oh, I'm going to do this. You were just gonna no. like no, see what comes thing, up. <laughs> yes, de definitely more that. But mm -hmm. one thing I can, um, that was part of the journey there, let's say, mm -hmm. is that I kind of wrote myself a training program. I brought my rings put up in, in the, um, mm -hmm. in the ceiling, just had a bit of a training zone with the, um, with the goal of, training a little bit and uh, you know losing some weight and whenever i come back to civilization i'll be in a, a little bit better shape like those associations mm -hmm. um and i was kind of fast a lot which not was wasn't only for that it was for the mm. other parts of that I might get into which just suits isolation and contemplation very well mm. um but basically a few weeks into that i recognized like this is kind of complete contradiction to what i'm trying to achieve here i'm still thinking about I, I i should achieve this and i should train here and I should like no no mm. uh, so what i ended up doing was the absolute opposite of that like mm. no this is the time to not try to achieve anything mm. so for the rest of the yeah i don't know almost two months it was just a few weeks mm. uh, i just let go of all of that and i didn't train at all mm. and i ate whatever i wanted and i ended up a bit more than a bit fluffy um but I think that was an integral part of, of the, uh, the lessons I, I could draw from that and, and mm. uh, detaching from, from having to achieve things to feel a certain way mm. um, and realizing that I already could feel that irregardless of anything. Mm. Um, and that's always been the case. Um, so, yeah, very helpful. Very good mm. part of my life, although very weird to look back to as well. Yeah. Because we were talking a few times when you were in the mountains because of your social media <laughs> exclusion, right? And I just had you uh, on WhatsApp, so we talked a few times. And you also mentioned yeah. Alan Watts, right? Which is both, uh, for, for both of us, uh, a teacher from afar or, or even from another time, really. Uh, you could tell me a little bit about how his teachings have influenced you in that it, or in doing that or in, in dealing with that uh, period. Yeah, no, I, I mean, it's, it's one of those funny things because he's been an inspiration for, for years and I've been listening to his videos and lectures for probably like half of every evening falling asleep to, to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to his voice. Um, but it, it, you know, you change the, 
um, environment or change your mind state of mind and listening mm. to the same thing will have a completely different impact. You know, you can read a quote or a line in a book one day and mm. it just this didn't have any impact. It didn't mean anything. But mm. at another point, it can change your life completely. So it's not only about uh, the information you get. It's also about where you are at the time. Mm. And, um, and that time in the mountains, even hearing things I've probably heard before mm. from Alan Watts, for example, um, made a massive impact uh, just based on that. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, yeah, I mean, it relates to, to Taoism um, mm-hmm. and, and Sam Buddhism, just w- where his space of uh, teaching is. Uh, mm-hmm. That's been largely influential, but again, that, that period was really, really solidifying it and, and um, connecting the pieces and uh, like understanding it on a much uh, deeper level than just uh, theoretical, let's say. Yeah, 100%. And that's also something that we've been connecting on um just in general right when we're talking is our affinity for philosophy in general but all, the eastern philosophy as well and i guess or i guess from what we see in society let's say and people in in our age category uh, especially in the west it's not really a thing you know it's a very it's a very small amount of people that either know of Alan Watts and then let alone do their own work in the Eastern philosophies, right? So what was kind of your entry into that? That's a good question. Um, I mean, like philosophy have just been a main interest since probably like 15, 14, 15, like very early. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's just general teachings, general philosophy. And then Stoicism was a very, very big and central philosophy for me mm-hmm. that I applied. Um, and, and probably I would even argue had applied um, mm-hmm. and then applied it even more when learning about it and understanding mm-hmm. it's theoretical. Um, and I think in many ways, the Eastern, it, it was a bit of a counter counteract to that, not mm-hmm. as in that it's contradictory or the opposite. If there's more similarities than, than differences mm. uh, but I think what where stoicism took me for a while may be necessary and I'm happy I, I, it took me there mm. um, but you know just really really embracing suffering to the mm. point of self-inducing it on yourself and be, being a bit proud of it because it builds character and strength and all of this mm. which I do believe but I believe it has to be balanced and counteracted by something more mm. accepting and, and letting go of the things um Mm. you can't control which again this can be said to be part of stoicism as well mm. um but i think that i needed that more more eastern uh, mm. part to kind of like ease back on it and be less active about like, yeah. actively letting go or actively no i cannot control this it's not the same as actually doing it you know what i mean mm. yeah and that's i mean it's also the beauty of philosophy in general but stoicism and buddhism or eastern philosophy because it almost doesn't matter if it's confucianism or country i I can't pronounce it and Taoism, but there's that overlap right and then the balancing elements and there's a lot a lot more to stoicism just like there's a lot more to to eastern philosophy yeah um because they both deal uh zen buddhism anyway maybe a little bit more than um taoism itself like dealing with suffering that's a a part of it right and then that's also i mean that that can go in a million different ways because there's so many different sub streams of all of them. yeah how how to deal with it sure exactly and that's also like (laughs) a very cool thing right to kind of go through that period of embracing hard hardship and you've used multiple tools for that right i know you you've been practicing extended fasting so beyond i mean so he david already said or mentioned it that it helps with being contemplative so as a spiritual practice but we can also use it as a practice of discipline right so you've done multiple day fasts you've done tri fasts so yeah man let, let's yeah. uh dig into that definitely a bit. and just you know within those things really combining mm. uh, uncomfortable things or or just experimenting like mm. breaking before breaking a dry fast hitting an hour in the sauna or mm. um like a long super intense training session 
mm. at the end of a three four day fast mm. um things like this just pu- pushing it and uh, um yeah mm. things that I, I still do and still still are intrigued by mm. uh, but there's definitely a balance to be struck there i think the further you take that the more you start to associate with um um like a direct correlation between suffering and and good things and mm-hmm. it's not that direct uh, mm-hmm. and it definitely goes too far and and at some point i think your self-worth gets entangled in in it and, and you have to continue to do it to yeah to feel mm-hmm. good about yourself you see that in a lot of people mm-hmm. um i i would say it's even two there's two um two spectrums on it or two ends of, of a spectrum mm-hmm. um asceticism could be the, the one and hedonism could be the other mm-hmm. it's just uh, just suffer as much as possible because it's inevitable anyway and the more you can learn to deal with it the better so just the more the better mm. uh, whereas the opposite is just avoiding it at all costs and embracing pressure and i mm. think both are severely mistaken and, and mm-hmm. this is very B- buddhism some buddhism is like middle the middle way yeah exactly middle. yeah man that's a very good one because i mean that also depends on who you're exposed to right but there's a lot of the just in the american culture anyway which we draw elements from right a lot of our information in the west and the cultural things come from there and then it's a lot of this like oh you know you need to grind you need to hustle you need to yeah you need to well not necessarily need to suffer but you need to you like yeah, go, go do that the overarching philosophy is is kind of that um, mm. uh, yeah america is definitely a good example because mm-hmm. it's kind of the, the they are you're either on both those extremes like mm. two, and maybe maybe that's one point you could make it's like hedonism mm. just pleasure seeking uh, behavior is what makes people lazy and, and fat and, and all of that that mm-hmm. um america is very well known for um mm-hmm. and to pull pull someone out of that they kind of need the opposite to just really pull it and mm. uh, that could be one argument but mm. i think in many cases you also see see it going too far there and mm. it's um and i would say in both cases the fundamental issue to work with is, is psychological and about self-worth and self-identification mm. and 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 those deeper things and mm. i think that's where you find the middle middle way yeah definitely because that's i mean which is also why we had the introduction like that it's a very intangible in a way right there's there's not like a blueprint to go like okay like here's how you're gonna work on not basing your self-identity and self-worth into things it that's uh that is an inner journey as a whole like there's a, a, anything like it doesn't matter what you read could could help you with that and what you experience and experiment with but it's um yeah <laughs> It, it, it comes from yeah, that, like, you need to kind of come to the realization, which we both had, like, huh, you know, I see that a lot of my self-worth, self-value, and then my identity are based in these things. And now I'm either not doing it, it them, or I don't care for it, or I've taken them to such an extreme degree that it's becoming detrimental to my health, right? And then, yep. of course, that has a psychological impact. Yeah, and then you can kind of, um, depending on how you far you are in that process, right? So if you're further along in the process, letting that die or letting that go becomes more natural, right? We've gone through iterations of our identities in a relatively short time span, I would say, where some people that have been so self-identified with one thing, it's a very painful process of letting that go right did yeah. you feel like no, it was painful, something yeah. like that that was there an element of self-identification where you felt a lot of pain letting that go or letting that idea of yourself go or struggle right pain whatever yeah is that a question yeah it's a or question just, uh, yeah oh, okay yeah 100 yeah i was <laughs> just agreeing so much that it uh, <laughs> Yes, it's definitely that it's very painful, and and that is why it still exists, and why people never really end up dealing with it is because it's it's a, in an immediate, mm. um, like if you just go there a little bit, it's mm. painful and and overwhelming, mm. um, and you're not not sure where it will lead, and, and chances are it will lead to more pain, which mm. probably it will, 
Um, yeah. And if you don't really have the tools or understanding to see what, what it is and how, how to go about it, mm. it's very understandable that you never end up working it out. And perhaps mm. also not getting the insight why it is important and that you are actually uh, sacrificing worse mm-hmm. things by not dealing with it. You yeah. know what I mean? Like long-term, fundamentally um, beating yourself down and, and, and not being yourself over years and years accumulates and mm-hmm. is ugly and, and, and that presents mm-hmm. itself in, in many, many ways on yourself mm-hmm. and, and people around you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that is always way worse than dealing with um, the internal psychological things, mm-hmm. although painful in the moment. So I think the first step is realizing that, and this is back to the suffering philosophy, it's like mm. there will be suffering either way. Mm. You just choose one or another. And then mm. once you see that clearly, it's a pretty obvious choice. Like, no, okay, I'll deal with this pain um, mm. to, to get a sense of my self-identity and, and, um, um, and all the things that will reveal, uh, I'll work with and I'll, I'll figure mm. that out. Yeah, as soon as possible. Because uh, you've had a pretty big transformation, if we can call it that, right? The the a metamorphosis morphosis that you said or it is now becoming more expressed externally. Did yep. you find that it was hard letting go of that previous self comparatively to where you're at now? Um. I wouldn't say that, no, uh, I wouldn't say that, that the external manifestation part was anything really conscious. It wasn't, mm. I had to let go of this to become that. There was no conscious mm. thing like that. It, it was merely a, an expression uh, of dealing with these in, internal things and, and continuously doing so. And once mm. you reach, like you, you got rid of one thing, it reemerges and you have to get rid of it again, but you also have to keep climbing it and going deeper and deeper. Mm. Um, and I think the mountains time as mentioned uh, mm. was a kind of really dealing with the last shit that, uh, because it's the most definitely it's not, you deal with it and it's gone. It's you deal mm. with it and then a pattern emerges and sometimes it's even more intense and it's like, mm. What a bitch. Now I have to like go even deeper down that hole mm-hmm. uh, of, of something you thought you had figured out. Yeah. Um, and then you expose yourself to a new scenario that reveals it even harder. That, mm-hmm. that was a big thing. Um, but yeah, I would, I would say that after that, it was an unfolding of mm-hmm. external manifestation. Yeah. Um, but not not necessarily conscious like i didn't mm. aim to become a certain way that's just how it ended up based on based on yeah. that mm. that's uh that's very cool and it's also it speaks to what you said right so when when we're doing the psychological work it's not the one and done right everything exists in layers and dimensions the psyche i mean even neurologically on in the physical realm as we can see it it works in different dimensions you're neurology so your brain is made up of different layers everything kind of works in different layers right so that's for people getting into it uh as david explained and as i've experienced firsthand as well it's like okay you've dealt with that on the superficial level or the first level let's say and then it, it's still all the way yep. into these other levels all you know, the way. Where... and i think i think at a point too because i became so aware of of these patterns uh, and how, how they kind of work um, on a fundamental level that I like either subconsciously or directly consciously s- searched where the point was that they really got exposed again. Mm. I, a good example of that is, is the martial art journey, which uh, kind of yes. started at, after the mountains. Um, mm. Definitely no coincidence in that in, in mm. hindsight. Yeah. Um, and just, you know, you let, let's like a direct example. You have, a word or something that you identify with. Mm. Um, I'm a confident individual, let's say. Mm. Um, So when something happens that makes you act the opposite of that or makes you feel that, feel the opposite, Mm. that's a bit of a detachment in in your person, in your being. Mm. It's like, no, wait a second. I I am a confident person, but I'm not, (laughs) I didn't act that way. Mm. Um, That that messes with you. And there's a lot Mm. of things to uncover. Um, and perhaps it's a, like a level of this, as um, 
disassociating from that specific label and realizing mm. it's contextual and you mm. don't have to be 100 confident all the time mm. but it's also about like how far can you be confident mm. so that's kind of what i ended up doing mm. a bit more consciously mm. uh, and in a more in martial arts setting that's just very obvious that you can feel confident in in one Mm-hmm. interaction physical whatever mm-hmm. um and then in another you get a little bit tired or someone hit you or, or there's a, just a mm-hmm. big intim- intimidating russian in front of you um <laughs> you will wobble a little bit but those are things you have to uh mm-hmm. to deal with uh, yeah because you started getting into thai boxing right my thai yeah yeah man and that also gives people the the of more well let's say psychological and thus philosophical understanding of a what's like a martial art isn't just a martial art which is i mean it's echo throughout the ages but it doesn't really matter if that yeah. information yeah, ever comes to you <laughs> many layers to that one too right it's mm. um, and on some some level i find that back to to what you spoke about that finding the people within a field that is combining the mm. philosophy and the psychological work, the mind and the body, basically, those are the most inspirational to me. But I also mm. think those are the best practitioners and teachers. Mm. Uh, and if, if they're a teacher, they're probably more aware and articulate about it. They think mm. about it deeper. That's, that's us. Uh, but even a pr- practitioner, you know, they, they, they realize that the, the mind um, has to be combined with the lessons they learn in, uh, physically. So mm. by, uh, in a martial art context, at the same rate uh, as you have to learn the techniques and, and improve your body and, and the, its capacities, mm. you also have to improve your mind. And that both comes from, mm. from getting pushed further than you were comfortable mm. and every single time and, and rebuilding yourself mm. uh, by basically every single practice. Mm. Um, and, and like you completely got shattered both physically and and your self-identity yeah. and associations mm. with yourself and you have to rebuild that and just that continuous process is yeah that's martial arts so martial arts is a great equalizer in the first place and a great exposer in the second place right or did this yeah. work in conjunction in the same place basically but as a yep. a martial arts teacher right as a crowd Maga instructor it was and as a practitioner, that was one of the main things like going into uh, MMA and submission wrestling and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and some Thai boxing about like how, right? So what David mentioned, how you can be very confident in one context. And if you like, we, we it's not like Kramga didn't have any groundwork, but it's not the same as somebody that spends their time, you know, working on the ground, like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu guys or submission wrestling. And then it's like a whole different dimension. And I was like, wow. You know, it brings all of these things up like, okay, but I'm at this level and I'm supposed to blah, 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 and all these preconceived notions. And that was a very good uh, personal journey for me as well, where you go through that. But then on the other side of the, uh, the teaching element, to see people being pushed, recovering, coming back, being even better, being greater, being stronger in your mind, right? That's a, it's a very rewarding, which is also something that we both experience from our from our work right? yeah and I, and I think this is fundamentally the reasons why the people that stick with the martial art really ends and end mm. up with it being a central part of their life and they mm. swear by it so even if they're not fully conscious and can conceptualize exactly why that is mm. that that is it yeah. um and it's also very metaphorically a um a lie, a, like the dosage matters because mm. you get you know everyone that quits martial arts is because someone went too hard and too intensely and just shattered them you mm. know, physically but most likely just ego wise and, mm. and it just was too much to handle at once mm. um and you know if if it's too much it's too much you get knocked out um, and mm. the same goes in life right um or it's ac- accumulates but accumulates too quickly and you can't handle it mm. uh, so it's, it's still a dosage thing and how much can you handle and then finding mm. that uh, well at least my my approach to it is be just below the max and really yeah. really push the, the boundaries there mm. which of course will mean you shatter yourself mm. uh, and all the identity shit just goes wild and you have to deal with that really intensely yeah. or you tune it down a little bit but uh, mm. I, I i don't like that 
<laughs> it's definitely no man i get it i'm right there with you and so that's also for people that don't know or i spent very little time in martial arts or around martial arts like the dropout rate for the first few months is immense so we've had people coming um and it did, didn't really matter if it was a uh, krav maga or submission Brazilian jiu-jitsu mma like the the dropout rates are very similar because the people that aren't ready to be confronted with their demons right and and all these things that because your ego will be shattered and your illusion self illusions will be shattered if you're not ready for that because it's not that much the physical part like it can get intense but still yeah. you know oh, definitely it can get intense but still not comparable and i i think just this is fundamentally the case mm. all the time whether you again whether you see it or not mm. and also one thing you made me think of there is like martial art teachers mm. um they smell this, like this, they smell when someone comes in with a little bit of a chip on their shoulder. Yeah. Uh, they, um, mm. you know, you can see it if you observe it, that they, they're just ready to like, put, like, no, get rid of that. That's, you're not mm. benefiting from that. And in many cases, maybe almost all, I don't think they're aware of that, that being what they're doing. They just yeah. kind of been in, in the sport, in the circles mm. for so long that they um that just goes automatically because it has to their role yeah. as a teacher is to do that yeah and uh, of course it's still a dosage thing and sometimes they push too hard which is mm. why the fall rate is, is so mm. high um but it, it's interesting to observe that they, whenever you have a little bit of a anything it's mm. they smell it and it will get exposed yeah so like working as a propaganda instructor and having practiced propaganda and then different martial arts it's if you come kind of with an open mind or an open awareness rather it's a psychological master class a few times a week and you become really good at like whether it's someone that has a chip on their shoulder or whether it's someone that struggles with self-esteem or all these different things you can just kind of pick them out like okay this guy's more like that that guy's more like that she's more like this she's been yeah. through something like that right it's very uh, obvious in their behavior and their the way their nervous system is wired right so how people react to uh first the confrontation and then being pushed uh, and then being instructed right so all, all of that data yeah it, it becomes this yeah, like it, okay. it's just mm. psych psychology in the end you know what mm. psychological patterns and behaviors do you have mm. uh, and that's from what you've been exposed to in the past Mm. Um, so people that, that some people they handle the the ego part well like they got they mm. in other domains of life they had, had that shattered and had to deal with it mm. others are like the hardship or the, the physical pain associated or the psychological pain mm. they're fine because they had to deal with that at another point in life mm -hmm. um, which is very cool to see and then mm -hmm. you know but which is probably also related to when where it is that people break and that's with the one um they hadn't been exposed to uh, yet and yeah. hopefully they, they don't break hopefully it's the exposure to it that they need mm -hmm. to write those yeah definitely and that's uh it, it also brings up a good point about going into these things yourself right into your weaknesses which i like uh with the krav maga stuff especially seeing that we were weak on the ground it was like okay Maybe go do some stuff you're not great at, right? Expose yourself to these areas of weaknesses. Like for me, it was the groundwork, which is something that I'm still um, getting into. I mean, we've been doing anything Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu since Corona hit has been off the table, right? For us anyway. But you started doing yeah. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah, no, definitely can do it here. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, new, new journey for me as well, the, the ground yeah man. how how do you like it so far no i it's, i know i would uh, and will like it i've uh, been a fan of of it within mma which is my mm. was a, one of my biggest interests mm. uh, as a fan and um uh, just the sport in general as well mm. um, so i've dabbled in it and i know enough about it to know that i will really enjoy it yeah. uh, so there's nothing nothing shocking yet mm -hmm. as in like i'm very expect I'm, I'm expecting what will happen as far as getting submitted and someone 
way smaller than you and all of this like there's no surprise there yet mm. so i'm thinking i don't know what lessons psychologically will come yet mm. um so we'll just have to wait and see on that when when i go further in it mm. i think there the it's a, a psychological lesson anyway that for me like i i didn't get very overwhelmed um after a while anyway like you let's say three to four years into Krav Maga, like when he was striking stuff, even with better strikers or tie boxing, kicking, so anything standing up. But it was far more overwhelming to be confronted with someone like a blue belt, right? With, which had like three-ish years under their belt, pun intended. And then they just kind of, they take you for a stroll. Like, it's just like, you're a helpless little thing lying on the floor. Yeah. Whatever they do. Yeah, no. I, I think I think I just know enough about it to. Mm. That's just gonna be the case. It's mm. like that's it. Um, but it, I mean, it is still a, a yesterday's session with a, a good friend of mine. We usually spar in uh, um, in kickboxing, mm. um, but he's a BJJ black belt, uh, mm. so extremely high level and intimidating, intimidating looking looking guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and he just wanted like. To, to roll with me obviously mm-hmm. just as like yeah this is gonna be fun and like in the other room we're pretty even uh but in here you know and he's just you know he puts his uh, feet on your hips and that's it so you know you can't do anything yeah. and he, he has a conversation with someone in across the first <laughs> room while you're having his his feet there uh, mm-hmm. so of course it's very very humbling and humiliating but not mm-hmm. unexpected uh yet no yeah man there's so much so much in there that is beneficial right on so many different levels and it's cool because yeah all all of those things are different dimensions right whether you're standing up or working on the ground it's a very it it is different it feels very different mma mixing them all is also very i mean it it changes the dynamic for people that haven't done any mma right it's there's kind of and that that also is what what i like about mma and what why i did it before i got injured is that it it has an even higher element of the unknown because people can do anything, right? They can take you down, they can clinch you, they can, like, obviously, if they've taken you down, they'll try to submit you or grapple with you, right? So they can fake a a kick or a strike and go towards, yeah, the clinch or the takedown, whatever, right? So your ability to deal with chaos, let's say, I found, like, that's, in in its yeah. best way, in the best way possible, in MMA it was like at its highest yeah. Uh, level. Yeah, right? for sure. yeah. The variables are just out of comprehension, mm-hmm. uh, even the physical, and, uh, and then there's probably even more to the to the mental game and uh, mm-hmm. all of that when facing facing someone like that and knowing all the physical variables that go into mm-hmm. it and trying to predict which ones that most likely will happen. Mm-hmm. Um, yet having to prepare for that probably won't happen uh, yeah. and i don't know and they don't know but they seem confident and mm. why am i not or am i uh, mm. all of that is just insanely impressive and and, and very hard to understand um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> which i think is why it's also the most beneficial one of the most beneficial things to practice uh, overall mm. yeah most definitely and that's also always something that i try to um kind of ferry people to right because it's such a i mean maybe after a while because i think the way you started like thai boxing and then getting more uh acquainted or familiar with brazilian jiu-jitsu and then taking things to mma actually allows for not just a smoother transition but also just yeah if you spend x amount of time in in each one of these before you go to mma you have a much better base to work with yeah. right so that's it, it's yeah, much easier to follow the whole concept when you have all the elements already in place than to learn all elements yeah. before yeah, you get I, I, think so, I think so too. It's mm-hmm. different schools of thoughts in that too, of course. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, uh, there, there's, uh, it, if you really respect and understand all the variables and details within each, mm-hmm. you should probably develop them pretty separate before mm. uh, combining all of it at once mm. and it might there might also be a parallel there in that like if you the, the, the muay thai community and the bga community are entirely different it's completely different personalities you know mm. and it's in, in the bali mma where i train it's it's 
what five meters apart it's one door and it's another yeah. world it's, yeah. it's pretty pretty hilarious it's just mm. personality and the psychologies of the people are mm. attracted to such different things mm. in muay thai and in day yeah and that's another you know when that's combined there's like mm. smack of so many different yeah. uh, personalities which is super mm. cool um that's also why it's uh, good but, to but, get exposed to different things yeah, in there exactly Mm. that if you don't do that i feel that this is a criticism i would have against the movement culture mm. like the biggest perhaps probably the biggest benefit is to go into a culture and understand the culture mm. that comes along with a practice yeah um, it's not you learn boxing with a few friends in the park uh, <laughs> by hitting tennis balls um on the wall um, mm. it's you go into it fully you go into the culture and, and mm. understand the people around it and the training approach around it while you learn the things mm. um, and within mma i think that's also the case you have to go fully into the muay thai mm. fully into all all the various arts yeah and then fully into the people that also wants to combine it in mma um, mm. and it also very, very important yeah but it brings up a little bit of the or I say a little bit, but I really mean a lot of irony when it's exactly the type of thing that, you know, people like Ido have done and some of his students do, but then the culture as a whole doesn't really do. Because if we backtrack yeah. through Ido's journey, he went through like, okay, I'm, I've done bodybuilding, powerlifting, gymnastics, uh, capoeira, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He's been part of all of these different cultures as he's kind of part of the boxing culture now in Israel yep. um, at, at the place that he trains. But it, it's that exact thing, right? So where the people yeah. that, that well, I would say that not just that I respect the most, but about that, that I learned the most from like you and, and, and Ido and, and other people like that is because they have exactly done that. Like they've, it's not like they have been in part of the culture or it's not like they went there and like, oh, I've done this for three months and then just kind of hung your hung up your yeah. car like okay yeah, especially if you go it. into it for a very brief period only with the intention of uh learning it for your movement practice let's say mm. like is that really the, the right intention to actually learn it mm. like mm. no no you go into it because you're intrigued by that culture mm. the end that's it mm. uh and then you see what you what information you derive from that and how that can be applicable and you can draw parallels mm. based on that um yeah. But you can't just step a little bit into it and just like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that, that's the same as this other practice that I, mm. uh, you know, oh, they do bridges too. It's like, no, no, that's, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's yeah. deeper than that. So definitely with you there. And, mm. um, yeah. Yeah. But that's also something that like, regardless of what it is, because as things are growing, right, we would see that even in um, nutrition communities, right? So fasting, as a whole like the way it has become that's its own culture right yeah. and then like people that do carnivore that's kind of its own culture and people that are in more into ancestral eating paleo etc etc right these all become their own cultures and tied to the thing that we said before which also comes with its mm, dark side to a certain degree is the self-identification with that but You've also done a lot of experimenting with nutrition, right? And and not necessarily maybe been a part of various cultures, but you've definitely taken. Yeah, no, I've it. stayed away from from specific cultures or, or mm -hmm. camps. Um, by definitely a lot of experiments. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not surprisingly by now. Hopefully. Mm -hmm. is that my my conclusion there is that it, it's it's about the deeper uh self introspective mm -hmm. things and letting that express itself onto something that is not a specific thing but what mm -hmm. came out of that um and and that was the biggest shame for me in in, in a dietary way it wasn't a switch between a carnivore or longer fasting or or mm -hmm. uh, more carbs more fats mm -hmm. any of those that specifics and if the the psychology on towards eating mm. um is not aligned let's say mm. uh, with with the intention what you're trying to do how you want to feel mm. and all these things then it's it's irrelevant and, and you changing one of those things 
is, mm. is that step seven uh, and you should be at step one. Mm. Um, and what that will mean at step seven when you have gone through the steps mm. is, is not relevant uh, in itself. Mm. That will be auto regulated by the prior steps. If that mm. makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. And that's also like it, it brings up that a good point, right? Because a lot of people's food issues quite generally aren't actual food issues they're psychological no. issues oh it's always psychological mm. I mean, obviously this is, is fundamental what i think about everything that it's mm. what else could it be mm. than your if it's your interpretation of something what mm. else is it than your psychological <laughs> patterns and, and mm. uh, you know so it, it's always traced back there mm. that's what's what the whole field is about and why people get get help yeah um and, mm. and also perhaps why people should get more help because it's not mm. about being mentally ill and getting help it's about everything that you associate with being a problem mm. uh, can help um mm. so yeah as far as diet goes it's just a manifestation of a psychological pattern that makes you eat mm. a certain way and, and if you're the camp hopper that just gets religious about mm. one diet uh, for a while and then finds another that you believe is way better for whatever reason Mm. And, and now you you know that tells you a lot about your psychology and, mm. and um, if you if that's a problem or you perceive that to be a problem it's not an, and then another diet that's that's the thing it's it's mm. going back to the root cause yeah most definitely and what was one of the major let's say shifts that you can elaborate on in your conceptualization or belief around nutrition that that changed that allowed you to yeah do, do uh, this back to the back to the whole self-worth and self-identity mm. thing mm. um and and having a more clear in, uh, intentions uh, on what you want to get out of it mm. um and um like what am i associating with this if i if i want to eat a certain way i want to lose weight mm. what uh, do i think will happen when i've done that mm. and looking back at my own personal uh patterns that was, um, I lost weight because I thought that would help me look better or perform mm. better or feel better. Um, mm. And then I would lose the weight based on that. Just mo motivation got, got me there or, or discipline, whatever you want to put it as, mm. probably. Um, but once there, nothing fundamentally was different. <laughs> so here comes the self-identity issue um, mm. and, and you get a bit split. Um, so you're not really, your mind isn't, what your body is expressing and what mm. your mind thought would be different is not different at all because it's still your mind. You didn't change anything internally. Mm. Um, mm. So that ended up with me gaining weight again because you, you, you revert back to where your mind is basically. Mm. Uh, and then I went through those cycles and, and I would look fast even more or I would uh, like, you know, just makes the swings even, even, you know, I would, <laughs> binge out one day and see the scale go up a little bit or just assume that I would have gained fat mm -hmm. and then there's a three day fast mm -hmm. uh, that was a pattern for a while just like counteract it instantly because mm -hmm. you know deviating from that is, is disastrous because I have to maintain this because mm -hmm. and I had no answer to that and when I, once I realized that it was pretty clear that it's a mm -hmm. um, the problem underneath is, is psychological and, and self mm -hmm. Um, accepting of whatever and, and back to the to the, the mountains um, mm. just eating whatever and, and, and getting rid of that as, the association and in a way and this is uh, when it gets a bit onto Taoism like mm. fully trusting that whatever is unfolding as a natural consequence mm. of me trusting mm. is preferred over me trying to force something mm. so it's like no I, I want to be in really good shape and, and physically perfect it's like now forcing that that's that's when you pick a diet or you look out ways training harder harder just to reach this and force it mm. no i came to the conclusion that if that never ends up happening um it's still preferred to me to let things unfold and detach make this psychological journey mm. and detach from all these things mm. and see how that expresses itself mm. um and that's what i feel has been happening since then Mm. Um, and all, also meant the biggest dietary intervention um, overall. And, mm. and we can talk about how that ended up being diet-wise. 
but yeah. the emphasis is it's, it's not really being relevant because mm. um, it's fundamentally not very very different. It's not, mm. not at all different, I would say, in the way I'm eating. Mm. It's just about the, the associate association with food, mm. uh, labeling things that's good and bad. Mm. Uh, how I would look about the, gaining a little bit of weight and, and freak out and I go go through the psychological show. So mm. all of that is irrelevant because mm. whatever happens mm. uh, is a consequence of how I'm expressing myself and what I felt like doing. Mm. And labeling that as a as a bad thing is uh, it's not very clever because <laughs> it's not that, that's mm. who you are always. Uh, mm. Yeah, uh, and I, I think that's. Yeah, man. And that's a big thing just in general where people go through that. I mean, as soon as you have a right and wrong, there's also, at least in our inherited cultures, right? This thing like, okay, if I did the wrong thing, I need to be punished, right? If I had a cheat meal, <laughs> then it's these three days of fasting. And that's yeah. a very different paradigm, right? Than a self-love paradigm where it's like, okay, I'm, I'm eating these things because they're good for me or because yes. I, I want to achieve A, B, or C or, or feel a certain way just in general. And a lot of the, yeah. Yeah, it's like one part of that too is, is this mm. uh, like realizing that you don't know, you know, mm. what, what you think a certain meal's impact will have mm. is just based on some knowledge that you thought you acquired, mm. but you actually don't know like, okay, this is an inflammatory meal. <laughs> mm. I will be, you know, that that's mm. your mind getting carried away and assuming things. That's mm. not actual yet, and mm. it might be true. And, and not to say that you shouldn't avoid things like that mm. on a, a physiological level, mm. but you can only make it worse psychologically by associating. Okay, uh, I'm eating gluten now, and I know mm. that's gonna have this effect, which is gonna make me feel like this, which is mm. gonna make you know that whole chain. That's mm. psychological, and that mm. that's not ever helpful. Um, yeah. yeah yeah most definitely so there's that element that you experiment and you experience and based on those things at that given time in your journey right it will have a type of effect and you go okay for this the time being this food works for me this food doesn't and yeah, it's, it's a weird balance too because it, it mm. can serve you and it can hinder you. It, it, you know, mm. If you have a positive association with a certain meal, mm. then you, it's basically just about self-awareness in the end and understanding mm. these things because you, know, you have a positive association with meat mm. because it's good for you. It contains things that's good. Mm. Or you have a positive association with a cheesecake because <laughs> you really, really, really like it. Mm. And those are both positive associations. Mm -hmm. And you can end it there. You can, you know, that's it. And mm -hmm. I think doing that will serve you way more and make things regulate themselves in, in the, the dosage of each, mm -hmm. um, as long as you keep that awareness. Mm -hmm. But it also has to be balanced with, uh, you know, some level of these are potential impacts of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 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 Two, two balances. No, most definitely. There's very little emphasis or and it's not even just an emphasis. Like there's very little talk about that or thinking about that in the nutrition space unless you come from uh, like no, clinical and, and psychology, effect, really. Yes, and it's for the same exact reason as, as we, we were on earlier that people don't, mm. it's painful to have to confront those psychological patterns. Mm -hmm. And why the fuck would nutrition or what i put in my mouth be related to that pain you mm -hmm. know that that's that's not something that is easy to deal with if mm -hmm. you don't understand the implications of not dealing with it and how mm -hmm. to go about it um so it's better to just change your diet when someone promises that that's better mm -hmm. um, there's no pain associated with that in the immediate moment mm -hmm. yeah yeah most definitely it's always everything, cir circumstance, situation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's an information about how you think about things, what you believe, what narratives you play in your head around these things, right? And that's that all comes back to that element of awareness, which is like that's always. I mean, at least in in my practice and the way I teach people um, as as a as my job that's step one it's like okay let's 
just make you more aware and see what comes up, right? And then you find your yep. way through the layers. Yep, that's it. And uh, like full circle back to the teaching that that's mm. that's the job you can do is kind of point mm. point out when there's a oh you're doing that thing again now mm -hmm. or like oh no like that thing that came up there and you said mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. how about you follow follow this path to to see what that's about mm -hmm. and that's that's your goal and the yeah, only man. the only way to actually improve someone in my opinion mm -hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> that's been a big one i mean for me personally as well where when I started my coaching, which is probably where most people start, whether teacher or coach, is that you're like, oh, we need to do this thing. It's all about the thing. You know, it's 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 almost or in, in very little cases when I was personal training, when I was started as a um, the holistic consulting that I do now, where it's like, oh, you know, we need to go through these things instead of just like, here's this person, right? And these are the things that, that he wants to achieve. And okay, here are your constraints, but it's not about doing yeah. the thing. It's just about how they're responding to the environment or the, the set of challenges or instructions. Yeah. That you're using. And then I've just kind yeah, of... I mean, right, you know, the one, one way of revealing people to these things is, is just about putting them in an environment that does that. Mm. Um, and that can be like poking on... on, on psychological things and how you phrase mm. questions that mm. makes them think about it on a physical level it can just be you pick an exercise that will reveal something to them mm. so they themselves make the, 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 the correlation or conclusion that oh shit mm. I don't have enough hip external rotation mm. um, and I can clearly see now how, how it's for benefit for me mm. um, you saying that and like you need more of this that's not as powerful as being able to Mm. put them in that environment and, mm. and that goes that's broadly speaking for everything yeah and as a teacher it's our responsibility to a certain extent to also be able to let go it's not about the thing like let them experience yeah. their own thing which also what yeah. he said was also why i introduced david the way i did because if you think about it, that's the Socratic method of doing anything, really. It's making people, it's not just about questioning themselves. It's about giving them information that leads to a conclusion in their own psyche, right? Whether yeah. that's a question or whether that's an exercise, like yeah. you said. Yeah, fundamentally, it is like the labeling of good and bad of thinking that you know mm. where this person should be going. Mm. I, I think it's, it's disrespectful as a, on a human level. Mm -hmm. And that would go towards yourself as well, back right mm -hmm. to what I was saying before. I'm trying to force a certain thing. And mm -hmm. being so, what makes you so damn sure that that's preferred? Mm -hmm. it, it, it isn't preferred that you don't know what will mm -hmm. happen in the future, you don't know what will happen because of what you're trying to force. Mm -hmm. So, saying that that is preferred is, is just not correct. Mm -hmm. Um, and even worse than doing that to someone else that you're intending to help, mm -hmm. and you end up not actually helping them because you're so damn sure in your head. Mm -hmm. with your probably narrow vision mm -hmm. um where you think they should be going mm -hmm. um and that's that's the field and and uh, as a whole and i mm -hmm. don't don't like it at all um and it's about so that is about letting go and mm -hmm. exposing them to things mm -hmm. uh, so they can draw their own conclusions and, and go their own path mm -hmm. um, and being, being there as a as a guide for that um, yeah that's also where we could draw um a line let's say in, in in using terms or in using definitions where coaches in general are much more aimed to the thing right it's like we need to achieve this because of whatever you said or whatever goal you have where teachers and guides it's more like i know you said this and we're going to expose you to these various things and we're just like it's like climbing a ladder right we're just going to expose you like one thing at a time and then see how you react to it and, and work our way from there. Oh, I mean, it, it's extremely <laughs> tricky because you can't also mm. someone have a goal of um, a handstand, let's say, and mm. you don't prescribe something relevant to a handstand. Mm. It's kind of like, how is this going to help me? Mm -hmm. And, you know, <laughs> your your answer could be like, no, no, the reason, the, 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 the issue and what you should 
deal with. You see mm-hmm. how I'm already making the same the same thing. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. in my mind uh, mm-hmm. is that you shouldn't be care, caring about the handstand. You should be caring about mm-hmm. the psychological patterns underneath why you think you want the handstand. Mm-hmm. Um, and now you you did the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so then you, if that's what they want, then prescribe a handstand exercise. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that's it for now. And then you work with those other things. Mm. Not because you think they need it now or, or whatever, but just mm. because you're exposing them to think, things yeah. to see what comes up for them. Mm. Yeah. And quite often, if for your future coaches listening or coaches listening now, like they'll tell you themselves with they they will come with their own findings. <laughs> and then you go, Oh yeah, that's great. You know? Yeah. And then yeah, awesome. you're trying like, to that's, see them. Mm-hmm. It's definitely uh, there's another what's one like that you you um, yeah it, it says it's a feminine art but like uh, convincing mm-hmm. someone that it was their idea all along mm-hmm. um, that's how you actually influence people like mm-hmm. um, and if you do that as a coach or, or someone if you just gone through it before and you see it in in someone else it's like oh yeah I remember when I was there. Um, mm-hmm. And you're not, you don't go like, oh, I've been there. This is what mm. you need to do, A, B, C. Mm. But you go like, oh, the only thing you have to realize to not do that is if, if someone did that to you back then, would it help? Like, no. Nope. Mm. Um, so the only thing you can do is plant some seed and mm. do, uh, do some little like, yeah, some pr- provide some form of information. Mm. And the more accurate and, and profound you can make that or concise, mm. the better. And that's probably the art of, of being a teacher. Mm. And, difference uh, the better ones let's say yeah. um and then that that ever ends up them being like oh shit i came up with this thing happy mm. days like good on you great job <laughs> yeah exactly and that also comes back to what you said before where it's about the these types of teachers or these types of guides when they think about influencing people it's more of like a Okay, I'm setting the standard, let's say, by my, I'm leading by example, right? These are the things that I do. And if you want to be exposed to these things, right, you're welcome to join that journey and I'll expose you to these things. And if it's not, then, okay, right, you can go find your your luck somewhere else. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Be, being clear about that, even if it's not a specified exactly what it will mean. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Because you've done that as well, right? In your in your things that you've put out on IG, where it's very away from the industry standard, like okay, this is this and that is that, in the sense like we've talked about that before, and, and I'm sure you have talked to Devin about that before, where it's like, okay, here you you are broken or this is your problem and here is your solution right yeah. that type of yeah no, i don't industrial don't do that thinking at all. And I, I find it fundamentally the, the main the, the biggest issue with the uh, the industry and mm. uh, and the, the psychological psychology behind it because mm. if, if to have a solution there needs to be a problem mm. um, so if there's no problem you can't provide a solution Mm-hmm. Um, and that makes it very simple marketing wise to give someone a problem or a plan mm-hmm. to see that they do have that problem so you can then sell them a solution mm-hmm. and that's like 90 or more percent of, of what everyone is doing is i have this solution to this and it mm-hmm. can be a specific thing in the body like a tight ankle i have the solution to it um, mm-hmm. or I, I need to lose weight or i have the solution to it mm-hmm. um, and what questions should be asked first and foremost is, is it really a problem? Mm. Um, and why is it a problem for you? Mm. And maybe you can even arrive at the point when it isn't a problem, like, oh, actually, that's not a problem. Mm. In which case, there's no need for a solution because there's no problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's probably what you should be concerned at as a coach is help them realize that fundamentally there is no problem. Mm. And, um, and that's very related to the nutrition side uh, that, mm. that I spoke about. Or, you know, weight loss. Uh, like Fundamentally, what are you solving when you lose weight? Mm. And if you can arrive at the stage with, with a client or them arriving there, um, mm. 
that it's like, you know, it's not going to make me a better person. It's not going to fundamentally change anything in the universe. <laughs> but I think I will, I will feel a bit lighter. I will have more energy and that will just help things. I mm. think, mm. you know, that is a tremendous starting point because you're not really mm. desperately looking for a solution that someone cannot mm. sell you. And mm. you cannot like disassociate it from the problem or even remove it completely. And that solved it paradoxically. Yeah, man. There we go. Awesome. That's that's Taoism in a nutshell. If I like one summary of it would be like realizing that there is no problem. Mm. That's the fundamental teaching of it. And, and like by forcing something, the moment you say that I need to acquire this or I desire this thing, mm. that's the moment you also admit that you don't have it right now. Mm. <laughs> so the problem is created, mm. right? You just created a problem by looking for the solution you, mm. you, you look for the solution before there was a problem basically mm. so realizing there is no problem ever is is a very good um approach or maybe thought experiment mm. yeah most definitely on that note i think uh, i actually like have all the answered or you've answered all the questions that i had and we we've dug into everything that I wanted to to address right and that's a beautiful yeah. note to end on so for Definitely. the people that don't follow you so where, where can people find you right because you have an ig yeah. handle and a site so yeah. plug them in here yeah right now it's it's my instagram uh, that's mm. that's it business wise free to frame okay um and i'm, I'm more and more um proactive with creating new uh, new content and the courses and i'm mm. very excited about uh, executing on the ideas i have mm. which will be, be way more related to the things we're talking about here and, and mm. making like fundamental uh, changes in with people mm. um and um teaching teachers a bit more mm. because that that is what i actually want to impact and, and what mm. i i don't like seeing the most um mm. and and that being related to to psychology um mm. those type of things and um then of course i'll, I'll still use the physical mm. practice and teaching mobility strength related uh, things as a mm. tool to to do that or or, or combine them yeah. um so yeah overall just uh, excited to to be more proactive and uh, and produce good quality content and yeah, man. free to but, frame. that's exciting so i'll put everything in the description below i mean everything meaning your instagram handle My instagram, right. that will that will lead you uh, uh, further yeah exactly all right david thanks so much for coming on man and have a pleasant day ciao thank you man peace